Done. Um, our next uh, speaker is the chairman of Gilt Group, Susan Line. And uh, Susan um, uh, attained that, that position of chairman uh, in the September of last year, but she joined Gilt Group uh, shortly after the company was launched. She joined the, the company as the CEO uh, of Gilt Group in September of 2008. And um, I got to know, this is, by the way, just so you know, if you don't already know, it is, it is the largest uh, flash sales site uh, in America and in, and in Japan with uh, three million uh, members. It is a membership uh, site, which I think makes it adds, adds to its, its interest, 500 employees and six distinct uh, different sites. Um, I got to know Susan when she was the CEO of Martha Stewart, who you heard yesterday, uh, and you heard all the, the, the glowing reports about Martha's business with us, with Home Depot, and, and how, how successful that business has become. And Susan navigated uh, that company as CEO when things were not quite as rosy, and she, she got that company through some very challenging times, and I grew to uh, respect her, uh, her abilities uh, during that, that process. She was a very, very effective leader, uh, someone who motivated the talent of that organization, assembled a great team, uh, and uh, did, a, did a superior job. And prior to that, uh, which has, she has a very interesting background, prior to that, Susan uh, was with Disney and ABC, uh, and she rose to the to position of president of ABC Entertainment. And in that capacity, she was the one who actually green-lighted shows that uh, you're all uh, well aware of, Desperate Housewives, Grey's Anatomy, uh, Lost, to name a few. She was the one who had to stand up and say, I really believe in these shows, and these are the ones that are going to, uh, to make it. So she obviously has a great nose for uh, what consumers want. Uh, please welcome Susan Line. Thank you, Terry. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, really great to see firsthand, Terry, what you're doing to inspire and train this next generation of retailers. Um, I think the theme for this year's conference is right on the mark. There's never been a time when the mandate to, to innovate and the opportunity was greater. Um, and I'm really not going to talk about the macro um, macro environment in this presentation, but I am happy to maybe touch on that in questions. What I am going to focus on this morning are two areas that we've been highly focused on where I think we're doing some very innovative work, and that's personalizing the customer experience and developing um, mobile applications. But first, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on our business our business model. There you go. Um, and what our customer proposition is. So I'll start with some stats. And to really put these in context, I think you need to understand a little bit about our business. What we do are short duration sales for a membership group. That means that you have to join in order to shop Gilt Group. We have limited inventory in every sale, which creates a competitive environment for shopping. It's appointment shopping. Every day at 11.45, we email all of our customers to say the sales are starting. And we really focus on newness. We literally change out the store every day just before noon, so it's a completely new offering on a daily basis. What that does, you can see with these stats, is to create a lot of frequency of shopping. So that three million plus number, um, our membership is actually significantly higher than that. We stopped uh, publishing what our membership numbers were because membership is uh, often misleading. You know, you. I'm sure a number of people here have joined 15, 20 different sites um, and never gone back after a first visit. What's more important are the people who become regular shoppers. So that monthly shoppers number, it's actually about a million three, million three fifty right now. Um, those are our core actives. Uh, the daily unique visitors you'll see is 400,000. So the number of times people visit in the course of a month is 
huge. And this correlates to all the other research we do uh, that says that a, an active member visits between eight and 12 times a month. Um, just a few other good stats here. We send out 10,000 packages a day. Uh, we have around 12,000 direct contacts with our customers every week. That's emails and calls. Uh, we put up 3,000 new photographs a day. We've got 12 very active studios over in Brooklyn. Uh, we are shooting day and night, but the, the operational aspects of our business right now are hugely complex. Our fastest sellout, you'll see right there, is under a second. <laughs> now that's a, that was a special instance. About two months ago, we sold three Volkswagen Jettas for about a third of their retail cost. Um, and there were hundreds of thousands of people there waiting for the sales to open so that they could, in fact, buy them. Uh, but we have a lot of, of, uh, of items that sell out in a few seconds. So it's a very speedy, competitive shopping environment, um, and it's, it's exciting shopping. So when I joined Gilt in uh, September of 2008, we were selling women's apparel and accessories. We were viewed as a fashion site. Um, since then, we've launched men's, we've launched home, kids, we launched a travel site called jetsetter.com, and most recently, we launched Guild City, which is really services and experiences on a local level. And we've repositioned the company as a lifestyle brand. There are three pillars to uh, what we do. The first is coveted goods. Coveted goods and experiences. The second is a simple, fast, and fun site experience. And the third, and this is what we're really focused on right now, is increasingly personalized shopping. What's not on this list, you'll notice, is discount. Uh, and there's no question, we love deals, our members love deals, but it's only one piece of our value proposition to them. Among others are access to goods they could not otherwise get, Curation, very important. We are not about selling everything. We're about selling great things. And newness, as I mentioned before. So let's go through each of those three pillars um, in a little more depth. Our members look to us for coveted goods and experiences, and we sell plenty of big ticket items. We sell Alexander McQueen runway dresses that may retail for $25,000 and we sell them for 10. Um, we've sold a $22,000 uh, pearl necklace. We sold a $20,000 gym membership last month. There are lots of big ticket items, but coveted doesn't have to mean pricey. We've also sold access to the Target designer collaborations before they went into stores. So those were not per se very expensive items, but they were coveted items. People love that stuff, and often they are completely sold out by the time you're able to get to a store. So getting early access to them was a big deal. We've also sold Starbucks micro lots of coffee. Um, they introduced a wild Galapagos coffee uh, about six months ago, um, and they launched it on Gilt. So, it was a $13 item for a half a pound of coffee, twice what they charge for a typical um, half pound, but, uh, but immediately sold out. We've also offered a lot of hard to find items. We've done three or four vintage Rolex sales recently that were hugely popular. We've sold vintage bags, um, great Birkin bags, We've sold guitars, we've sold vintage cars, um, and the experiences range from uh, the obvious, like spa services or uh, restaurant reservations, to really almost priceless experiences where you can dine with a famous chef or, um, or you get access to the player's room at an athletic event.
Uh, so uh, clearly, the range of prices is vast, uh, but it's all about coveted goods. The guilt experience. So for a long time, Amazon set the bar for what e-commerce was. They really defined it. Um, we look at e-commerce very differently. Instead of being reliable and convenient, we try to be addictive and fun. We don't try to offer everything, as I said. It's a limited number of sales and a limited number of items in every sale. One of the things we've discovered that's actually very interesting is if we put more than about 40 items into a sale, uh, there's hugely diminishing returns. Those items down at the bottom get far fewer views than everything else at the top. Um, we're not about text-driven browsing. This is about visual browsing. It's about being tempted by seeing something that just speaks to you. Most sites have got persistent product. As I said, we change out the store every day. It's not about searching for product. This is about discovery. You come in, there's anticipation. What am I going to find today? Will there be that thing that I've always wanted? And literally, I think people get emotionally excited at about 11.55, we see them literally lining up. We can watch the number of people who've registered growing on a chart inside the office. And at 11.55, you see that, that spike go up and people are sitting there hitting refresh, refresh, refresh. What am I gonna find today? Company. We've put a lot of resources into this over the past year. Um, what we're talking about here really is using data from browsing, shopping, and depends to create a member-by-member -member personalized shopping experience. So what is personalization? It's not expecting a customer to fill out multiple fields to indicate their preferences. That's not what we're talking about here. Personalization is tailoring experiences and products to each customer based on what we know about you. So why can we do this? We can do it because every time you come to the site, you have to sign in. Most sites do not know who is actually shopping on their site. We talk to our customers every day, and they talk to us, not just through their calls and emails, but through their behavior. So there are hundreds of factors that can play a part in uh, what we show you. Um, some, obviously the most obvious is gender, and we do immediately split our new members into male and female buckets. Also where you live, I mean, it's obviously not particularly useful to show a sale of overcoats to people who live in Tucson, so geographical is important. But we also know if you have an interest in travel, if you've ever clicked on a jet setter sale, uh, looked at a product detail page. Uh, we know if you are interested in items that are over $1,000. We know if you've browsed a vintage handbag sale. And we've done a lot of work creating brand clusters that will let us know the likelihood of you being interested in a particular brand. So if you've shopped a Mark by Mark Jacobs sale, we know the other 15, 20 brands, and they're not always obvious at all, um, that you will likely find appealing. So we built a very robust data warehouse of internal and external data. Um, we track what you've bought, but also what you've browsed, what you've waitlisted. We have a waitlist function, and uh, if, if you've waitlisted anything, that goes into your data. Um, we know what you've tried to add to cart. So if you've tried adding something and someone got there first, we've got that piece of data. We know what sales you've entered. Uh, we know where you entered from. And we know how you've, you've responded to different marketing offers. To that, we append external data from third parties that give us a demographic profile, psychographics, 
what you read, et cetera, et cetera. So here's an example. About a quarter of our members now get a fully personalized email at 1145. Within six weeks, we're going to be rolling this out to all of our customers. On the right is a standard email. This is from last week. Uh, the only personalization on that is gender-based, and, and we do that for every member the minute they join. Um, on the left is the email I got that day. So what you'll see, um, I buy an obscene amount of stuff from our, our home store, so I get a lot of, of home sales in uh, my email. I also buy dresses. I like dresses, so I've got two dress sales in there. Um, when I first looked at this, I thought, why did they put watches in there? And then I realized that about six weeks ago, my watch broke. And so for about six days, I was browsing every watch sale we had to see if I could buy something quickly that I could use until I had my watch fix. So that will probably disappear in, in another month or so as they realize I'm no longer browsing watches, but for the time being, it was a good call. We're seeing a 7 to 12 percent lift in revenue from members who are getting this personalized email. So it's, it's actually having a, a significant impact already. The key to being able to really serve this up are two regression models that we run daily. They actually run overnight in India while we sleep so that the next day we'll have an updated look at this. The first uh, looks at what you've browsed, what you visited, what you've tried to add to your cart. The second looks at all your purchase behavior. Um, and we do uh, look at brands there, but primarily at, at uh, categories. So um, it's much more effective as a a category-based model. In addition, we send emails to you uh, to alert you anytime a designer you have bought from before is again on sale. Uh, huge lift in this. It can be 30, 40 percent. And we've developed a series of welcome emails, too, that introduce new users to how guilt works and then drop you into a sale of items um, and price points that we know convert people fastest. The next frontier is gonna be personalizing the sale mosaic. And I don't have a slide on that. I didn't realize I didn't until I got here yesterday, but um, any of you who have shopped on guilt know what the landing page looks like. It's got, you know, anything from, uh, let's say, eight to about 15 or 16 different sale entrances. Uh, those are going to be personalized. We've got a pilot group of about 10% um, of our members who are now getting a personalized mosaic. We're tweaking it, and we expect within a few months to be, again, really serving up a fully personalized sale mosaic to all of our members. In that, that pilot group, by the way, we're seeing at least a 10% lift in, in uh, revenue from the people who are getting a personalized mosaic. So this is interesting. This is uh, a recent focus group we did with members who are part of that personalized email group. The products they show me are the ones I want. They are based on what I'm currently looking for either on their site or other sites. They know what I've bought before and I don't buy large bags. When I call and talk with them, they know me and can really help. And this is another example of where this robust database is actually helping us. Our customer service agents now can pull up within seconds your entire history with us when you call. So they know you by name, they know what you've purchased, they have a pretty good sense of what you might be calling about, and they can certainly talk to you as a friend and not just as a, what can I do for you today? Um, and then third, when there are problems with my orders, they tell me before I find out. This is uh, 
one thing we have really worked on over the past year is making sure that, that the experience is as good on the back end as it is on the front end and have really become significantly more proactive in alerting our members and our customers to anything that could be out of the ordinary. So if we think that your purchase is not going to get there for an extra day, we're going to let you know about it. So the second area I want to touch on is mobile. And again, this is an area we've spent quite a bit of time on over the past year. Um, very major initiative for us. The reasons were obvious. You know, the iPad and the iPhone in particular seemed like huge opportunities for us. We have a highly aspirational customer. We knew they were going to be early adopters. And so we made sure that we had an iPhone app very quickly. And we launched our iPad app with Apple when they launched the iPad, which also gave us um, a great marketing platform because they, they pushed our app uh, quite heavily. So we have over a million downloads now, um, which may not sound huge when you compare it to a Starbucks, but we're a members-only um, small business relative to a lot of retailers out there, so a million downloads is huge. Uh, uh, the reasons we did this are pretty obvious. Uh, we thought we'd be able to drive incremental revenue. We also knew from just comments we were getting from particularly our West Coast members that the noon start for our sales was really frustrating for some of them because they're on the road commuting to work uh, or they've just gotten into the office and not so cool to first thing open up the guilt sales when you land at your desk. <laughs> so this became either a slightly more discreet way to shop with us or, uh, or something you could do on your morning commute. Some interesting, little surprising things that, that uh, we discovered. One is that while our membership and our site visits and our site revenue has always been uh, predominantly female, 70% is actually a good stat. It sometimes gets up to almost 80%. Um, on Gilt Mobile apps, it is 50% female, 50% male. Uh, we are now seeing about 15% of our, our revenue weekdays coming from mobile apps and 25% on weekends. And this is incremental revenue. We sell just as wide a variety of price points on mobile as we do on our site, which was also hugely surprising. We sold a $15,000 necklace two weeks ago. We sold a $3,500 rug. And it's useful to realize that, that that rug is not returnable. We do not allow um, items to be uh, be returned if they are not sized items. So we'll take shoes back, we'll take apparel back, um, but not home goods. So unless it's damaged, that person was going to live with that $3,500 Kyle Bunting rug, whether the color was perfect or not. Um, and two of the three Jettas we sold in that sale in December were bought on mobile apps. Um, and one of the one of the things we realized pretty quickly is that it's actually faster shopping on our apps than it is if you access the site on a computer. So some of the lessons. This may sound obvious, but uh, most people who are launching apps tend to replicate the experience on site on their app. And what is really critically important is to, uh, is to design for that device. Um, we have really focused on making the iPhone app something that allowed you to get instant access to sales. We now do daily deals on our iPhone app. 
one simple decision to make. Do I want it? Do I not want it? Um, again, simple, fast, and fun, uh, but it's been a huge conversion draw for us. Um, and the iPad app was really, really created for browsing. Um, you can open it up so that every picture can be full screen. Um, it's a gorgeous experience. Anyone who, who uses an iPad knows just how clear the images are. So we really did it as a luxurious experience that you could play with lying back on a weekend. Um, again, uh, it's been far more successful than we expected, and it's actually been informing a lot of our thinking about the next generation site experience as well. The second lesson was to really optimize for weekends and downtime. Um, clearly, most of our members access our sales at their desks, noon, take a little lunch break. There are plenty of companies uh, where we hear, everybody on my floor stops for 10 minutes at noon so that they can shop the sales. Well, <laughs> I know. <laughs> always makes me happy. <laughs> um, and, and I'll segue here for one second, but one of the, the nicest moments that I had when I first joined Gilt was going to see a friend who was a managing partner at a large financial services firm who um, that could not for the life of him figure out why I had left Martha Stewart to go to this little company he had never heard of. And he listened politely while I told him about it. And he said, you know, sounds really interesting. And I really hope it's going to be a success. And I said, you know, it's, it's noon. Let's just walk the hall and see whether anybody here is using guilt. And literally, we walked down this hall. And uh, I would say 60% of all the women we passed had a guilt screen up there. And he looked at me and said, just let me know when you're going to IPO. Um, so, just getting back to mobile, um, uh, we find that particularly in our, our home category where we do have um, expensive items and these are, are considered purchases, uh, that weekends are critically important and there's no better way to shop for a rug or a piece of furniture than on an iPad app because you can walk around that living room or that bedroom, see how it's going to look in, in that room, and really develop a lot more confidence about purchasing. Um, speed, stability, scalability, um, all critically important and really complex issues for us on these, these apps because we are, as I said, photo-driven. Images are critically important. You saw how many images we have in a typical day on our site. Um, so being able to deliver that in a way that, that keeps the simple, fast, and fun piece of our, our customer promise um, is a, a challenge. But it gets better all the time, and we are constantly upgrading these apps. So I want to just spend one minute at the end of this just talking about some of the sites that I look at that I think are doing innovative stuff. I could have put in 20 sites, um, but I think it's really important. All of us have, have big jobs and stressful jobs, and the tendency is always to put your head down and to try to optimize your business. And I think it's a huge mistake right now. This is a moment where the world is changing so rapidly, and the speed of innovation, particularly in this digital world, is profound. And if you don't spend at least, I don't know, 5% of your time every week looking at what other people are doing, looking for sites that are doing something new, something innovative, um, I, th I think you're going to miss the boat. So these are just three that I think are particularly interesting. Um, the first one fits me. I have no idea whether this is going to scale, but they've created a robot. Um, and in fact, uh, 
they, they are willing to bring the robot to, uh, to, to conferences, so maybe next year you can have them. If you type in your measurements, this robot morphs into your body size. It's just got overlapping plates that can expand or contract, and it's quite extraordinary. What the promise is here is that they can actually get you far closer to, to a promise that what you buy will actually fit you. We all know fit guides are, um, are dicey at best, um, and this is one of the things that is most important for e-tailers to solve. How are we going to create a virtual fitting room? How are we going to get people uh, to know whether to buy the six or the eight in that particular brand? Every brand cuts a little bit differently. If you know a brand well and you know what you wear in that brand, it's fine. But with brands you don't know, it's challenging. So worth looking at this, uh, it's very clever. ModCloth uh, is a, a company that sells vintage-inspired women's apparel, um, and they've done a really interesting thing with crowdsourcing. Uh, they, if you see that middle bar, and I know this is an eye chart, um, it says, be the buyer. Uh, what they do is to put a number of items that they are thinking about uh, producing out, up on the site, out to their community, and let them vote on it and comment on it, so that by the time that dress comes onto the market, they have a consumer base that's highly invested in it. And they've been growing, really, at an extraordinary pace largely driven by this highly engaged uh, uh, community piece of their business. And the third one is a company called Looklet, which is just really fun to play with if you haven't. It's a Swedish company, uh, and they allow you to create outfits on a very sophisticated um, and, and really well done template. So you can choose your model. They've got, I don't know, 50 or 60 models, male and female. Um, and then you can choose items and you can, you can dress them. It's, it's paper dolls for a more sophisticated consumer. And it's great. They already power H&M's, um, I, I can't remember what they call it, but it's their style section, create a look section. Uh, but it's a, it, it's a very smart company in Sweden, and they're doing far more sophisticated work in this area than I think any of the American companies are. So those are just three that I think are interesting, but there are dozens of others, and um, this is definitely a new frontier. E-commerce is, is an area that is changing very rapidly. When Gilt launched, uh, we were the new kid on the block, but since then you've seen so many new business models, Groupon being the biggest and most obvious one, but we're going to continue to see innovation in, in the space, and I think focusing on what you can do um, online that you can't do offline uh, is a great place to start. So with that, I'll take questions. And it doesn't have to be about what I've covered today. If you've got questions about guilt in general, I am happy to answer them. Hi. Uh, hi. I really liked your presentation. Um, I'm a very Where are you? Right over here. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm a very frequent guilt visitor. <laughs> very glad to hear that. <laughs> um, and over the past year or so, I've noticed that um, some of the different sites for men and women both have started to have excuse me, quite a few, quite a number of less sales per day. Is that for any particular reason, or is that just because you're trying to focus on the sales, certain sales more? Can you repeat that? I didn't quite get the question. 
Over the past year or so, yes. I've uh -huh. noticed that there are fewer sales for each division, men, women, home. Uh -huh. Is there any reason that that's taking place? Huh. That's, that's interesting. Um, we've reorganized the way sales appear so that you only see uh, six sales at the top of the page. If you scroll down, you'll find the sales that started yesterday that are ending at midnight. And then below that, you'll see sales that are coming up. Um, so it may be that you're only seeing the top rows. Uh, we get comments that are exactly the opposite of that sometimes, which is there are too many sales and I, I can't figure out where my sales are, which is one of the things that really drove this, this personalization project. Um, or it could be that you're in our, our pilot group for the personalized mosaic uh, and that we're serving you up fewer sales as a result of that. But um, I can check on that for you. It's interesting. We, I think we, uh, we overcorrected um, about 18 months ago, when we launched the new businesses, uh, we started putting far more sales onto the, uh, the daily mosaics because we were trying to encourage more cross shopping. Um, and I think that once we saw the impact of that, which was in many cases lower uh, revenue per sale, we corrected the other way. Um, and it's all about finding a balance. Susan. Yep. Uh, over here. To your left. Okay. Susan, you and I met and used to sit together at New York Fashion Week when you're Premier Magazine. Ah. And since there are so many students here and your career and your roles have been so dynamic, what has been your skill set that has allowed you to go from magazine editor to TV executive to Martha Stewart executive to Gilt Group executive? Mm -hmm. Because it's a quite dynamic run and I think the students would learn a lot from that. Um, I'll tell you a few things that I think uh, are part of it. One is that uh, I think I have a short attention span, <laughs> uh, which can be a good thing. Um, I, I love to dive into a new business and to learn it. I'm a lifetime learner, so being able to move into a new industry and to bring what I know from, from the industries that I've worked in before uh, is, is very exciting for me. I, I don't get scared about the idea of being a novice again, and I think it can be really scary when you've spent five years or ten years building up both uh, knowledge and and credibility in one industry, to go to another where there's a whole new language and to, in many ways, have to start the whole process over again, asking people, tell me how this works, um, can be scary if you look at it that way. But to me, it always feels like a, a huge opportunity and my mind gets more, uh, more alert. Um, another thing is I love working with, with all kinds of creative people. And there are business people who don't like the creatives, who kind of look at them as a necessary evil. I genuinely like working with them. And one of the aha moments for me when I came to Gilt was realizing that our engineering team, and particularly the front end engineers, were just like my writer's room at ABC. They had the same kind of lifestyle. They come in around 10. They stay until about 10. You know, they like to have games and things that will distract them because you can't be creating all the time. Um, and there's a clear pecking order. There's huge respect for the person who can get from point A to point B in the most elegant way. So everyone can can write a script, anyone who's a, a staff writer for a show. But they'll all look up to that person who can just write the really elegant script. Um, and the same thing is true for code. You know, Lots of people can actually code, 
but the guys who can come up with an incredibly elegant solution for this problem um, end up being the alpha male in the room. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I like the new. It's, uh, I, I thrive on stress. <laughs> I was having this conversation with someone last night who I had met for the first time and we were both agreeing that we, we actually enjoy when there's a lot on our plates and we're being forced to multitask. I'm the wrong person to go into a company that is doing well and just needs to get a little bit better. Um, because I, that, I think, does not tap my skills well. I'm much better with a startup or with a company that needs turnaround where, uh, where the stakes are high and, and I can take some risks myself. Um, so I think the key is always figuring out how you work best. Uh, it's, this is really something I say when I talk to students a lot. You may think you want to go into X field, but spend some time on the floor really trying to understand what the day-to-day -day is of that business. Um, because in some cases, it's not really what you expect. And the most important thing in finding happiness and satisfaction in any work you're doing is being able to say, I love every day I go into work. I love what I do from 9 to noon. I love what I do from noon to 6. Um, finding that place where, where the pace and the, the way people work, whether it's collaboratively or, or as individual contributors, is right for you. So that's what I'd say. Yes. Speak up, whoever's got... I see you. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question for you is, along with Guilt Group, I've also visited similar sites like Rue Lala. How do you guys compete with similar sites like that in differentiating yourself in the online market? Good question. Um, we certainly keep an eye on, on all the sites that are in uh, that flash arena. I think what we've tried to do is to stay focused on our customer. So we know that, that we have a customer who is aspirational, young, um, educated, primarily urban, um, and we look at really how can we serve you in more and more parts of your life. And that's how we came into launching jetsetter.com was the idea that, well, this group of people likes to travel, so maybe we can find a way to get them better hotels, better uh, resorts, better vacation experiences if we try a similar model for travel. Um, we also try to stay focused on what's possible. So whenever uh, there are new innovations or new technologies we can tap into uh, to create a better experience, um, we look at that. We never try to play a catch-up game with anybody. Um, we stay very focused on our core business and where we need to get to. So uh, as we look out at the next year, um, we're going to be launching several more sites. Uh, one uh, that we are in all likelihood moving into is gourmet food, uh, just being able to bring a lot of the small producers, artisanal producers, to market. Um, we have a customer base that we know is obsessed with cooking and eating, and, uh, and so it feels like something where we can innovate again and create something new and fresh for people. And it will have a heavy content element to it as well. We're also launching a full-price men's business in, in the fall. We've built about a $100 million men's business just in, in off-price flash. Uh, men are, we believe, highly underserved in the e-commerce market. 
um, even all of the, the uh, uh, major department stores that have men's stores, you still have to go through the women's store in order to get to your stuff. So after hearing from enough guys about how I don't want to go through the perfume department to get to, to polo shirts, um, we've decided we're going to really try to create a great men's department store online. So we're, we're always looking at, at what opportunities exist out there, um, where we can use our current assets, which are a platform, a customer base, a membership, um, and relevant other stores to launch new ones. Okay, thank you very much.